PhotoShelter is the leader in online portfolio websites and tools for professional photographers. We help you get business, do business, and keep business. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alan Murabayashi speaking to you from New York, the world headquarters of PhotoShelter.com. We have a great webinar today that we're producing in conjunction with our friends over at Tamron. And we have a really, really special gift that's going to go to one of the attendees of this webinar today. And we're super happy to be joined by a wonderful uh, pair of photographers, educators. They happen to be husbands, uh, husband and wife. Justin and Mary are joining us today. Uh, we're trying something new today where we have uh, not only the video, but we have the slides beneath it. We've never actually done this before. I know it's 2015, but we've never actually done this on this software before. So hopefully nothing will go wrong. Um, let me tell everyone who's attending, we have a free... Tamron 24-70 to 2.8 lens that we're going to give away at the end of the webinar today. And you're automatically entered to win it, but you have to be on the line when we give it away to win it. So hang in there. We have a lot of great information to share. Uh, and now, hey, Justin and Mary have been shooting together since 2006 in Connecticut. How did you get into the wedding thing? Yeah. Oh, well, that's two very separate stories, so I'll let you tell yours, and I'll tell mine. Yeah, I started, um, I, I went to school for advertising photography at RIT, and uh, the last year I was there, I was assisting a couple different commercial photographers, uh, one of which was uh, Tim Toll out of Rochester, and he was also a wedding photographer. Mm -hmm. And so when I was assisting him up in Rochester, he would, um, you know, we would work together on weddings for about a summer, and then after that, he started referring weddings to me. And so um, it was 2003 that uh, I started shooting a few of my own weddings. And so I moved down to Connecticut, um, actually, to work with another advertising photographer named, and, named Jody Dole, and, who's amazing. And at the same time, um, I met Mary, who was uh, finishing up her second year at Yale Law School. First year. First year. <laughs> my apologies. Uh, first year. And so um, she was kind of helping me on the business side of things, you know, figuring out my contract, my pricing, figuring out that I was basically losing money on every single wedding that I was shooting. <laughs> um, and um, it, it wasn't until 2006 after you graduated that um, we, went, we went full time together and we started shooting together. Yeah. Um, I think that's such a wife thing to do, right? As the guys telling the story to be like first year. Right. Five years. Ten years. Um, yeah. So I just finished up my first year of law school and um, we met. And so for two solid years, I just help, um, helped out with like the contracts and the business stuff. Uh, marketing, mm -hmm. um, what we thought we were doing for marketing at the time. And um, in 2006, when I graduated, we I had two law firm offers, one in London and one in New York, for $140,000 plus signing bonuses, plus travel expenses, Yikes. expenses. So a really, really good deal. And um, we, at the time, went to our very first photography conference out in Los Angeles, the Pictage Partner Con, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it was, in, it was, we still love it because it was, what gave us our start mm -hmm. and um, we actually um, the way I ever shot my first wedding with Justin was that his assistant got um, a stomach bug she got the flu and so I just filled in at the last minute and I fell in love with it mm -hmm. and we've been shooting together ever since so this is our oh, what is this ninth uh, year full-time yeah, seems longer than that yeah <laughs> now <laughs> how how did you guys get into well so we understand the wedding thing was it kind of happened, but then you fell in love with it. But you spend so much time helping to educate other photographers and speaking not only about photography, but speaking about the business of photography. Where did that come about? Oh, gosh. Um, so how do we get into teaching, you mean? Yeah. Or, well. Um, and why do you like helping people? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so. Uh, I think teaching's kind of always been a thing for me. Like when I was in law school, it was not to be a lawyer, really. It was to be a law professor. Um, and when I first went to college, it was to be a third grade teacher. I don't know why third grade. I really liked the third grade. I guess. <laughs> um, and then when I was in college, I got to coach the debate team that I was on my senior year. And I just, I really love teaching. I think um, there are people who are born to be teachers. And um, I, w I wish that there were more of the, those people out there teaching right now um, because they're speaking and then there's teaching and they're not the same. And um, I think when you love teaching that high, when somebody gets a light bulb moment, um, that's where any amount of followers on Instagram or Facebook or whatever you would as long as you can kind of help that one person and know that their business and their family by extension gets better because of something you said or help them with I think that's just like that's kind of our ultimate drug um, me in particular um, just because I wanted to do that for so long and then Justin I think is just a natural teacher like 
He can explain the most complex lighting setups and you know algorithms and formulas in ways that um, I can understand. So if he can teach it to me, he can teach it to pretty much anybody. So he's just sort of got that natural talent to make things um, make sense. Uh, I want to put a shout out to a relatively new website that you guys launched, JustinandMaryWeddings.com. Thank you. So for all of you out there in internet land, check check the website out. It's not only uh, the wedding services, but there's a whole section for education in the blog and whatnot. Fantastic uh, Thank information. You so much. Yeah, we appreciate you sharing that. Um, it's kind of been a labor of love over the last uh, year or so putting that together. We worked with an amazing designer in Jen Olmstead, yeah. and uh, just it's been really exciting since we launched uh, at the end of January. Yeah. So this first slide, ways to elevate your worth. You know, I'm looking at that new website and thinking about brand mm -hmm. um, and the perception that that the brand imparts to anyone who comes and visits it, and 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 also thinking about you know. Uh, a lot of people who are entrants into the wedding space, they always start by undervaluing what they they offer. Yeah. So it's common to say, well, I'll shoot that wedding for free, and I'll shoot 20 weddings for free, and now I'll, I'll charge $200 to shoot a wedding, rather than saying, uh -huh. you know what, to get out of bed, it costs you $300, so you better right. be charging $1,000. Can right. you talk about what worth means to you guys? Yeah. Um, actually, when we gave this talk at WPPI, um, I had one slide like this, uh, well, similar to this that said, make your work worth more. And the more, um, all of our friends are texting us because they can see us online. <laughs> so, <our phones laughs> <are going up. laughs> um, so um, we love you guys. Hi. Um, so we've had the first slide that said more, and then we had um, the second slide pop up, and we put that focus on worth. And the reason that we did that is that I think it can be really tempting to say, um, you know, we kind of came into this industry in a time when it was like, talk about how much you're charging and your your worth was totally based on how much you're charging. And we kind of wanted to flip things and say, let's go back to that core of what it is that we're bringing to the world. And if we can make that actually worth something, then the price stuff um, will, you know, follow naturally. So, um, gosh, that was a really long sentence, but let me kind of <laughs> dig in a little bit more with that. Um, basically for us, what worth means is we believe that there are you know, two things that our business can stand for, and that's the way that we love and serve the people who are right in front of us right now, and then the things that we leave behind. And the reason I think we're both so in love with photography is because by its very nature, this work that we do, um, when we're gone, without having to do anything else, photos, they stay, they leave, you know, <laughs> what am I trying to say? They will uh, live on after us, and we get to leave a legacy because of that. <clears throat> so if we can get both of those things right, the way we love and serve our clients right now, and the quality of the work that we leave behind, we think that worth will go up. And, and <laughs> you know, there's a – I loved attending WPPI. I've been there a couple times just because there's a kind of a palpable feeling of optimism, and I hear that in the way that you guys speak. I wonder whether there is a – a cautionary flag to throw up, though, and saying, "Oh, if I just love taking pictures, then everything's going to take care of itself." Oh, right, totally. Yeah. Right. I so, what's the what's the practical approach to saying, "Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna be true and authentic, but I got to worry about making sure I'm making money." Heck oh, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think you need both sides of it. I mean, we talk about you know when we when we get into talks about marketing, we will shift the focus and say, you know, we also have to focus on. Uh, the end product and how to elevate that. And we talk about lighting, we talk about posing, we talk about photography. We also talk about how you have to elevate your marketing, your branding, your presence in the industry because one doesn't succeed without the other. Mm. You can be an amazing photographer and if you don't know, you know how to handle yourself as a business person or you don't know how to, um, how to price yourself correctly, you're not going to succeed. Yeah. And so um, I think, I think they, especially in wedding photography where we're dealing with consumers, it's very important just to have to be able to have both and to be able to have a good balance between both. Yeah, and in the WPPI talk, I actually talked about my dad as an example. Um, he's owned a small business his whole life. Um, he inherited it from my grandfather and started working in it as a logger when he was about 12 years old um, down in West Virginia. And um, I talked about being a little kid, being seven or eight, and watching him and my mom at the kitchen table over a stack of bills um, that they couldn't pay and a phone that wouldn't stop ringing. And it wasn't because he wasn't incredibly talented at what he does. He's actually been voted like the top logger of West Virginia. Um, he's kind of a rock star among loggers. But it doesn't matter if you're a rock star, and it doesn't matter how many Instagram followers you have, and it doesn't matter um, what, if you speak at WPPI. If you're not getting right with the money side of things right. and the working side and the business side, we've been doing this for you know 
10 to 13 years, depending on when you judge it. And we've seen so many talented friends of ours go under because they just couldn't get right with that business side. Yeah, yeah. Um, show much, much less. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is a really terribly grammatically amazing set slide. Right? <laughs> but um, I like, I like the, the, the use of imagery with kind of the veil. Yeah, the <laughs> oh, secrets. I didn't get that, but I'll totally pretend like that's what I meant to do. <laughs> Um, yeah, so when, we're, when we sit down, we kind of, the whole talk that we gave out there and the whole um, talk we'd like to have with the people who are at home sitting behind their computers watching this is to kind of imagine what we would be saying to you if you were sitting on our couch for a mentoring session um, because we do a lot of those. And the whole idea for this year's talk, um, how to make your work worth more, came out of the fact that mentoring session after mentoring session, we were saying the same things to people and the, that people were struggling with the same things and not even realizing that it was holding them back. And so this is the first one is that I think photographers tend to have this belief that if they can just show a bunch of stuff on the website to show sort of the variety of things they can do, that it's working for them. But we actually believe that it's working against them because um, if I'm a potential bride and I see this one amazing photo that you took on Facebook and I really connect with it and I really love it, at that point, on some level at least, there's a 100% chance in my mind that you're the photographer I'm looking for, and that I love your work and you take amazing work. And then if I come over to your site and I immediately see one, a photo that either doesn't fit with the style I'm looking for, or is just kind of pretty average by comparison, that gets sliced down to 50% right away. And it just continues to kind of get watered down. You think that you're showing all the, all the tools you have in your tool belt, but it's really just watering down your best work and the work that most clearly sends the billboard for this is what I actually want to shoot. Because one of the other things we learned the hard way is that there's a market out there for everything. And so I could show, you know, a ring shot in a brandy snifter in a wine glass um, superimposed with a Tyrannosaurus Rex behind it and somebody out there is going to want that shot. Right. And so we have to be really careful that we're very carefully sending this brand message with everything we curate and put out there. Um, and so one more thing, and then I'll, sorry, I'll let you tag in, yeah, is no. some of our most powerful shots in the, in the talk, we went and we pulled um, kind of like our, some of our most signature shots, and then we paired them up beside with other kind of pretty average shots from that shoot. And just the impact of the difference of them by themselves versus, hey, look what else we did, it just immediately watered them down. You went through uh, almost a year-long process of redesigning your website. Yeah. Um, and, and all of the things that you're saying must have gone through your heads. I'm wondering whether there was kind of one or two things that surprised you about the process um, oh. as, you, as you went along. Um, With everything that you know and everything that you talk about, was it still like, oh, wow, we kind of didn't really think about this? Well, I mean, I will say like right off the bat, something that we knew is that for the last two years solid at least, every time we were sitting down with somebody on our couch and saying, you need to clean up your galleries, you need to clean up your brand, we would always follow up with, and we're preaching to the choir here because we need to be first in line doing this too, and we're right. working on it. Um, so I would say that it's an ongoing process because the brand that we just ditched, we launched and loved and was brand new and got a ton of, um, <clears throat> got a ton of attention in 2008. Uh, and it was us and it was totally, you know, on point and it was new and it was fresh and it fit with the work um, but that doesn't mean just because we did it right you know six years ago that we don't have to keep constantly evolving mm -hmm. and there right. will probably be a point um, six years from now that we'll have to six I don't know we spent a lot of money on this one yeah. maybe ten Hopefully this one lasts <laughs> a little bit longer <laughs> um, but it will we'll constantly need to make sure we're showing the best work and showing the best foot forward so that was kind of not a surprise but something we learned along the way I would say something that was kind of surprising um, is that what we ended up with has <clears throat> a lot of the feelers of what we told our designer we wanted to begin with. We said Burberry, Restoration Hardware, J. Crew, some sassiness of Kate Spade, the elegance of the Ritz Carlton. And so a lot of that is there. Um, but I think through kind of us pushing back and forth with each other, we actually created something that's a little bit different than I would have thought it would have looked like, mm -hmm. but it's more us, just through going through that year long kind of soul searching. And so I would say to allow yourself that time. Like get up a, a good brand because that's your storefront. That's the first thing your potential clients will see, something that's serving you well and going to work for you in the meantime. But don't be afraid to take your time on the one that's going to be the one you really invest in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I guess, the, the you know, it's not like putting together a printed brochure when after the design work is done and it's printed, it is done. Right. Um, so yeah, much I mean, about being online is kind of an organic evolution, as you said. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And and working with a platform, I think ours is ours is based off of Show It's platform. Mm -hmm. And so it just gives us the ability to be able to make quick changes if we want to, or if we shoot a wedding and we have a, a, a new portfolio image, just to be able to drop that right in and have it be live right away. Um, yeah. I think that's that's been a huge change from our very first website, you know, when we started in two thousand three or two thousand four, is that, you know, every time I wanted to make a change it was like a call to the designer and she, yeah. I have to get on her schedule and figure out you know when we can get this changed and six months later you have a different website but now it's so it's so responsive and so quick that it's yeah. like Jen, Jen did the hard work to design it and, and build it mm -hmm. and now it's just we can go in and make quick little changes if we need to yeah right it's just finding that time to make sure that you can do it right, right. <laughs> that's right that's definitely right let everything you do build trust yeah so for this um, this part of the mentoring session, we would be taking a look at um, in every way that you're interacting with your clients from that first email in all the way through um, delivering their album, really, is everything you're doing saying to them that you are a legitimate business that has invested in themselves, and so they're, you know, they feel more comfortable investing in you. Um, if you kind of like do a quick Google search of like, you know, wedding photographer scam, right, it's going to pull up all of these thousands of reports of wedding photographers who botched the images or who never delivered the files or who ran away to Fiji with the album money. And so, you know, the, for these couples, they're doing it once and, you know, hopefully, and um, they really want to get it right. And they really want to know that they can trust the person who's who they're giving all this money to to both deliver on what they say they're going to do and then also just actually be able to do a really beautiful job. And so there are a couple different versions of trust. The most basic level is and I say it's basic, but we didn't have this right when we were first getting started. So I think it's worth covering quickly is, are you incorporated as a business? Do you have a separate business account? Can you take checks? Can you take credit cards? Is your email address not sexykitten123 at AOL.com? Right, right. um, and are you meeting somewhere that feels more legitimate? Like we used to meet in coffee shops like pretty much most wedding photographers are doing now. But it's really tough to meet with a couple in a coffee shop and know that it's probably the same coffee shop they met with four other photographers and expect <laughs> you to stand out in any sort of way. And so just having kind of a little more, we're priming people on what to spend by the way we meet with them. So having a nicer meeting space, having nicer materials we hand over, instead of doing a flimsy pricing sheet which maybe says how we feel about our prices, we're actually handing over a nice embossed box with our new logo on it wrapped in ribbon with all the information in there and a, a gift just for meeting with us. And so, so trust is almost legitimacy of the business in a lot of ways. Totally. Yeah. Right? Totally. And then I think it's also um, trust is born out of connection. So like I said, there are a few different parts of it. There's legitimacy of the business. There's um, do I look at your work and I see a consistency. So part of showing much, much less is making sure that you're taking out anything that's kind of a, a big um, deviation, a big right turn away from your normal style. So I'm going along. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Whoa, what the heck is that? Ooh. Am I going to get this thing I love or am I going to get that at my wedding day? Um, so making sure there's consistency of the work. And yeah. then I, uh, the third one would be connection. Um, trust to me also kind of goes into this whole notion of a, a lot of marketing for wedding photography comes from referrals. Yeah. Uh, and oh, referrals yeah. only happen when there's a pretty large degree of trust between the person making the referral and the, and the thing that they're referring. Yeah. Is, do you do you rely on referrals a lot for your business still? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say that's probably the number one place where we get most of our business, um, and those referrals come from uh, other wedding vendors, so florists and caterers and planners. Uh, yeah. They come from other photographers that are booked on that day, and it comes from you know the brides, the groom, our past brides and grooms, their friends, their family, their bridal parties, and people who have seen their images. So I think you do have to build trust in you know, all those different areas. Um, you know, it, it comes down to delivering images to your vendors, getting them beautiful images that they can use in their portfolios. Mm. It, it's talking about, you know, building good relationships with other photographers that are in your area, helping them out if they need help, uh, being a support system for them, and then also, you know, being able to give great referrals to them when you're unavailable. Yeah. Um, and then also just, you know, serving your clients as best as possible. You'll, you'll start to get that great word of mouth from the couples as well. Yeah. So a lot of, okay. yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think something we're going to talk about a little bit later is once you've kind of built that trust and you've made people feel really good about 
hiring you, then kind of giving them the stories to go out and tell their friends. Um, because, you know, awesome people are friends with awesome people. And so we want our ideal clients talking about us to their friends and bringing us more people just like them. And so, I so a lot of people are asking, you know, what, what marketing promotion can I do to improve my yeah. business? And in the hierarchy of things that you could do as a, as a wedding photographer, do you think really working on the network trumps, like, uh, you know, putting a Google ad or yes. an ad in the yellow pages? I absolutely do. Um, I'm really passionate about this stuff. Um, I think that there are lots of people who will say um, <clears throat> that they focus a lot on their SEO, that they focus a lot on Google, or they do Google ads. And I think they, there are people who are getting a lot of success with it. Um, but I think it determines, it depends on how you determine success. And so for us, we always like to say the booking is not the win. Um, booking the client who sees you as a transaction, who has no interest in who you are as a person, or your life, or your business succeeding after their wedding, who wants to hand you money and you hand them, you know, the images and then you never talk to each other again, that's not the win. Um, and mm. we um, firmly believe that the way your clients find you trains them on how to think about you. And so when we were first getting started and we were doing bridal shows and print ads, which were the equivalent of Google um, ads now, we were getting bookings. It's not that we weren't getting bookings. It's just that the people who were hiring us saw us purely as that transaction and they wanted to pay us change the goods, and then walk away. And so what that meant is that every year's harvest was as hard as the one before. Um, that we were kind of, we like to call those planting seedless watermelons, right? Seedless watermelons are really ripe and juicy when you're getting that booking, when you're getting that retainer, and you might enjoy them for a season. But if you only plant seedless watermelons, you have no new watermelons the next year. And so for us, we really believe that when somebody comes in and they've heard about you through word of mouth, they've heard about you through the network, then they're trained to think about you and care about you as a person in particular, right? So the absolute worst feeling as a photographer is, I need a photographer. You're a photographer, you're a photographer, you're a photographer, uh, you'll do, right? That's like, well, awesome, right. I feel great about that. So let's have a wonderful relationship now. But if somebody comes in and they have said, listen, I don't care what you have to do with your catering budget or your flowers, you have to have Justin and Mary in particular, then it changes everything because they're not gonna be the people who come in and nickel and dime us on the budget. And they're not going to be the people who um, try to get us to include more stuff, right, or who put us through the ringer. They want us in particular, and there's only one place you can get it. And we have found that those kind of clients only come from somebody hearing something um, that's not just that somebody's talking, but what they're saying. And I think we're going to talk about that. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves with the slides yeah. um, in a little bit. People will pay more for passion. I guess it's that, that's part of it, understanding who you want your audience to be and not not – only competing on price. Yeah, I mean, I think I think passion again comes in all different forms. You can see Mary's passion for you know being able to to serve their client, serve our clients the best as we can, but also just in the type of images that we like to create. You know, yeah. we get passionate about you know shooting in beautiful stone mansions on the on coastal Connecticut. You know, and and so like we can create our best work when we're put in situations when we're excited and when we're excited about the couple and we're we're excited about the venue yeah. and the wedding. And so um, I think that starts to come through in your portfolio. When you, when you show images that represent what you're most passionate about, um, you're going to be hired more for that and people are going to pay more for that. Yeah, I think a really good example um, from a different realm um, to show that really clearly is that last January, Justin and I started two wedding blogs um, on top of having our photography business because, I don't know, we wanted a challenge. So <laughs> we added a little more to the plate. Um, and so, and not just one, but two, two wedding blogs. We have the Black Tie Bride, which is the blacktiebride.com, and uh, wellgroomgroom.com. And so, when we launched those, those two blogs blew up in ways that we never, ever, ever thought that they, we could have imagined, even within the first month. We, in the last year of having those blogs, we've had people at Martha Stewart, Style Me Pretty, uh, The Knot. We've had all these people reach out to us about collaborating um, with the blogs. And I think the reason goes down to this, that people... Um, fight harder for things that they're passionate about. That we're looking for those companies in the world who believe what we believe, and when we find that, we will go to extraordinary lengths to include them in our lives. Hmm. Um, that's a quote from Simon Sinek in the book, Start With Why. And so when we put out the blogs, we put out a mission statement right with it from day one that said, we believe black tie is a state of mind, not a state of budget. We believe in grandparents' pictures and wedding silver frames. We believe in history and legacy and good manners. We believe that timeless always trumps trendy. And most of all, we believe that classic never goes out of style. And we launched those blogs because we were tired of being turned down from wedding blogs that said no black and white images, no emotions, send us details, send us details, send us details. 
And they were training this entire generation of couples that details and pretty things were the only things that mattered instead of a marriage. And so we put them out there and it was filling this gap that people were passionate about and they felt they believed what we believed. And so they took up arms and they fought for us and they connected us to people we never would have had happen if we didn't have that place of passion that we started from. And, and had they not achieved a threshold of success, would you, would you have just considered it a marketing experiment and shut them down? Or what was, did you think that far ahead? Uh, well, <laughs> dang, <laughs> Alan. I, you know, I'm sorry, I always want to go back to the practical. I, I mean, I think you know, we, we're willing to evolve. And if they truly weren't yeah. working for us, then yeah, we probably would have shut them down. Um, we're also the type of people that will push pretty hard. So even if they weren't working, we'd probably try a little harder and try a little harder and then yeah. eventually eventually shut them down. But yeah. I think uh, you know, the, way, the response that we've gotten in the last uh, 13, 14 months has been overwhelmingly positive. And so yeah. um, I think it just motivates us to work harder and try harder and, and build yeah. them up even more if we can. I do agree with what you're saying, though, of like you can't just keep going down a path if it's not working. Um, Abby Larson at Sound Me Pretty actually gave us some really great advice uh, about four or five years ago, and she just said, trim the fat. Don't be afraid to trim the fat. If something's not working, don't waste any time being embarrassed about it. Don't waste any time feeling bad about it. Just cut off what's not working and move forward. And I just loved that, like, you know, kind of like, I don't know, cutthroat sort of like, cutthroat's the wrong word, but this just sort of like, let's go get them kind of attitude. And she said every day was Sound Me Pretty. They wake up and they try new stuff, and some of it doesn't work, and they just kind of kill it quietly, and some of it blows up into their biggest idea. And well, so and I think... Yeah. What what you're saying is that there's a difference between being passionate about something and then also having the emotion cloud judgment. Totally. Absolutely. Totally. Right. Yeah. Or just making smart smart um, smart decisions as a business. So right. you know, when we first got started in our business, we were imagine imaging. Whew, right? And so because <laughs> it was like one letter apart, you know, and it looks really cool in the logo. And um, right. we got everything but imagine imaging. We got images imaging, imaging, imaging. And our personal favorite is imagine imagining, which is really deep when you think about it. Imagine imagining. Very meta. Uh, and we could have said, listen, gosh, we've already printed business cards. We've already put up a website. We have to stick with it. Like, you know, uh, it may not, maybe it's not working. Maybe people don't get it. But like, I don't know how we go back from that now. It'd be so embarrassing. But we right. just like trim that fat and move forward as Justin and Mary, and I'm so glad we did. We sit down. I am all too. The time. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Oh, good. We all are good. Um, who are just a, they're petrified to make a move for making a misstep, you know? And we sit down with people who have their one booking shy of their booking goal, and they're afraid to change their prices because they're afraid they won't book the last one. You right. have to be willing to take those risks, you know? If you if it doesn't work, so what? Try again, right? Shoot the weddings you're getting like the ones you want to get. Oh yeah. I'm gonna let you start with that. I like that. Yeah, I mean, I think this this goes down to you know, especially when you're first getting started in wedding photography, like you may not be getting these beautiful grand ballrooms and these awesome venues with tons of great details, but I think you can approach the wedding day in a way where um, you can attract the kind of couples you're trying to get and attract the types of weddings you're trying to get just by the way that you're shooting them. So for us, what that meant was um, you know, focusing on emotion, focusing on um, passion and excitement in the, in the, within the couples and less about the details that are on the tables. And then when we are photographing the details for the couples, finding them, you know, putting them in the best possible light, so lighting them uh, really well, getting a little bit lower, shooting across the tables, super shallow depth of field to cut out any of the junk in the background. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, do what you can to, to show them in a way where they it elevates what they actually look like individually. Yeah. Um, we'll actually send you a link after this, Alan, that was a slideshow we put together of two weddings because we hear this, you know, conversation all the time of, oh, well, I want to shoot this kind of wedding, but I'm getting either really small, cheap weddings or weddings that are really tough to shoot. And so we put together this slideshow of two weddings that have become our most signature weddings. Um, one was an elopement in New York where there were five people total, the couple, their efficient, and the two of us. And the efficient can't be the witnesses, so we were. We actually you know? signed the marriage license. <clears throat> so really, really tiny, low, like no budget, really, um, wedding. And then the other one was a beautiful wedding, but everything took place in December in Connecticut. They didn't want to see each other beforehand, so it all happened at dark. Um, <clears throat> and it all happened inside, really, because she couldn't yeah. be outside in the cold too much. And so when you go into those weddings and you say, okay, but this is, this is my passion, this is my why, this is the style of photography that sets my heart on fire and what I want to be known for shooting and get hired to shoot, then you can go in and you can use... Uh, the way you're lighting, dimensional directional light, simplifying the background, and using, like Justin said, shallow depth of field, 
to make everything just look a little more classic, a little more elegant, and actually show them in the way that you want to shoot in the future. Um, and so one other final example with that is we shot this beautiful bride, you know, she looked like a 1940s dream, she's on this like green wall, she's looking off to the side, and um, then we showed the picture where it was actually taken, and it was the Sunday school classroom with little baby Jesuses and Moseses <laughs> on the wall, you know, all intermingled, and stacks of chairs, and um, just a really dingy, terrible carpet room, but when you go closer, use dimensional light, simplify the background, shoot at one four, you can make that Sunday school room that a lot of us start out shooting in, I think, um, look really still very classic and elegant. So, you know, you, you talk about dimensional lighting and you talk about being put into really dark situations, which I think every wedding photographer yeah. and, and arguably every photographer has gone into a situation where they're like, I can't believe how dark it is and I, I have to take photos. Yeah. At a certain point, there is a little bit of, a, a little bit of a conversation about gear and knowing what to do with that gear. Oh, right? yeah. Absolutely. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, I I think the the beginning thing to do is be like, ah, it's so dark. Let me just crank up my ISO. And then the second the second thing you do is you're like, oh, let me pop on my flash and see what I could do with that. And so you're working with on camera flash, yeah. and both of those can work up until about a certain level. And then it gets to a point where, you know, you want to create a little bit more texture, a little bit more shape to your subjects, and um, you want the light to feel a little bit more natural. And then it starts getting into off camera lighting setups. And so. You know, I think as a progression, as a photographer, young photographer starting out, it's you're probably going to start with working with speed lights, and as you you know grow and grow into your business and grow more comfortable with your your equipment, uh, then it can get into much more um, advanced equipment. And so, um, not that this is like difficult to use in any way, but we've been using the Profoto B ones um, for the last year and a half, and they're absolutely incredible for being able to you know have that light off camera, be able to shape it with all their different modifiers. Um, and then also having the flexibility and ability to use TTL to, to you know, get the exposure in a pinch when you really need to. So there are things that you know you'll grow in comfort level with depending on where you are in your journey of a, as a photographer. But um, it it definitely becomes part of the equation as well. Yeah, and just to add to that, we had a slide um, at WPPI that said a commitment to the craft is knowing how to bring the light. And <clears throat> we shoot weddings. In every, you know, like you walk into a wedding and you think this is going to be a softball. It's going to be natural light the whole day. It's going to be amazing. And then you, I, I um, wrote an article once where I said, show me the situation where the photographer planned to go all natural light and I'll show you the situation where it went wrong because we've <laughs> been in those situations. Right. And we now have that. I think an off-camera setup complete with an umbrella and a softbox is absolutely essential gear for every single wedding photographer out there. And it's, it doesn't have to be scary. We teach a, a workshop called the Justin and Mary Lighting Intensive where we break it down and we show you that all those setups are really just big windows. And if you're not scared of a window, then you shouldn't be scared of them. Right. Um, and so, but yeah, I think everybody should have that ability to just, whatever it is you're going to be able to deliver for your couple. Because like I said, they get one shot at this. And what you, you having a bad day or you not knowing your light um, isn't good enough. The number one question we're getting so far is, what do you do when families and friends ask for discounts? Oh, <laughs> that's a good, man, question. Such yeah. a good question. Um we've probably done everything, every answer that's possible here. We've right. we've done it for free, which can be okay because then there's very little expectation. We've done it for a discount, which can be a disaster because they expect a lot and then are not paying you a lot and you feel like you're getting slighted. And then we've also done it just for normal prices and then just they they pay a little bit more, but then you get the same kind of respect and uh, yeah. level that you're used to. Um, so I would recommend probably the either extreme. I would say either do it for free yeah. and say this is my gift to you. I just want to, you know, I want to get you guys great images. Yeah. Um, on you know, you're getting ready, your ceremony and your portraits, and then maybe have somebody else come in for the reception so I can be a guest at the wedding as well. Right. Yes. Right. The guest part is key. Bacon wrap scallops. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, or the other end would be the other. The other end is if just, they're not close enough friends or family that you just say those these are our prices. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they understand. You know, if they're a good friend, they understand that you're worth what you're charging. So. Yeah. Now, before we talk about making your brand work for you, another question that we've gotten is, uh, and 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 I'm thinking back to uh, this mentorship. So you guys handed out a year-long mentorship to to uh, a starting photographer at WPPI. Yeah. Starting photographers, you know, we, we talked at the top of the, the webinar that said you have to invest um, to make 
people know that you take this seriously and to build trust and whatnot. But what if I literally have $200 to spend on my marketing? Mm -hmm. How do I think about my brand when I don't have a lot of expertise and I don't have a lot of money? So if I, the question is if I had $200, what would I do first? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, have I shot any jobs at all? Maybe, maybe you assisted and maybe you shot something for a friend. Yeah. So I think my first wave of investment is always going to be that brand. Um, it's, it's a weird thing to say. I think focus on your branding is kind of a thing that gets overused a little bit. But if, you don't, if they don't make it past that first 10 seconds to 45 seconds at your storefront, it's going to be really hard to get any of that other stuff going. So there are templates out there that are in the $200 range. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that we love are from Tonic Site Shop. They're a little more expensive, but we think that they, um, they're more of an investment, but we think that they return a lot more. But they're, they're the, there's the whole range out there. And so we've probably kind of Dave Ramsey it. If, I, if it were me, I would like use the 200 to get my temporary template up there, my design up there, and then I would save for the next one and do a better yeah. one six months from then. Um, but I think that that storefront, that kind of get you through the door, that threshold, is that first thing that's probably getting most people, um, they don't even know the business they're losing because nobody even inquires. They don't make it past that stage. Mm -hmm. And so I would get that beautiful storefront up there with the curated 30 to 50 amazing images and I, then the next thing I would probably invest in would be gifts for the clients that I start booking and the vendors I start working with. Yeah, I think yeah. there's a lot that can be done, like Mary said, with the $200, but then there's also a lot that can be done for free. Um, you know, just getting yourself out there, talking to other photographers, so yeah, going to, that's right. um, there's a lot of like meetups or networking groups that you can go to, just get in there, talk to people, say, hey, I'm just getting started, you know, is there anything I can help you out with? Yeah. And then eventually as you start to build relationships with other photographers, that'll help to build that referral network up a good bit as well. Yeah. Um, you know, being able to take out, I mean, maybe not right when you're first starting taking out a, a planner to lunch, but just being able to help out on shoots or styled shoots or um, head, you know, do headshots for, for other vendors. Anything you can do that doesn't cost you anything except your time uh, to help you know, build good relationships within your network. I mean, I think what's really cool and we kind of take for granted is that as photographers, we automatically have this gift that we can give people that everybody's looking for. So if we were florists, for example, it would be a lot harder to just be like, here, I've made you this bouquet. <laughs> right. and they, people would probably love that, but it's a different value than, hey, I noticed you needed some headshots on your site, or hey, wedding planner, you don't have any behind the scenes photos of you at work because the photographer's always with the couple during that time while you're setting up. So. How about I come and just get some photos of you doing what you do? Or, hey, you're having this workshop. How about I just come, you know, be the photographer for that? And, um, or shoot your family photos, shoot your Christmas, Christmas card photos, you know? Um, I see you're moving studios. I'll come lug boxes, right? There's a lot of stuff that we have at our disposal just by what we do that won't cost us a lot of money. You, you guys have talked a lot about, you know, getting the, the, a good gallery, a good edit of images that represents who you are and the types of images that you want to be shooting. Yeah. Uh, to be practical again, I, I'm looking at a, a beautiful shot on the screen here, um, but it's not out of camera. There's been some post-processing. How, how, and, and I'm not saying that in a, in a derogatory way at all. I think it enhances the photo in a lot of ways. How important is my personal understanding of Photoshop to my success as a wedding photographer? Oh, well, that's actually really interesting because the only Photoshop that's been done on that image at all is I took out the um, exit, sign. exit sign in the back and I straightened up the parallels just a little. But the rest is just what's happening with the light in camera. See, I know um, nothing about anything. Oh. <laughs> that's okay, though. That's okay. Um, <laughs> well, it's but, lovely. Thank you. That, thank you. <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's a good question, though, because... Um, one of the things that we did when we were going through this talk of making your work worth more is we went and we pulled images that were on our website circa 2007. So not that long ago in the grand scheme of things, right? That's eight what years. year are we in? Eight. Yes, eight years. Um, and eight years later, um, the actions and the processing and the Photoshop we were doing on them, the, the moments themselves, the composition and the actual photo itself was really good or getting good. Um, but the stuff we, the kind of like crap we tossed on top of it was the exact thing that made it dated eight years later. Hmm. Um, and so when we're teaching our workshops and our kind of philosophy, we kind of really lean towards, um, you know, classic never goes out of style. So keep it really clean um, and keep it kind of really true. And then you, you know that it's not going to become this thing that was really hot in 2015, um, becomes a trend, becomes a fad. And we never want somebody to look at our photos and go, oh, so you got married in 2015, right? <laughs> right. Um, I can see that from the photo. 
And you know, we always say we shoot for that silver frame on a couple's mantle where that picture will still be beautiful 60 years from now, um, as beautiful as it was on day one. And that doesn't happen if we make it really, really time sensitive. So we try to keep it really clean. Yeah, I think just a simple basic understanding of Lightroom uh, is, would be enough to get started. Just be able to make adjustments in your uh, exposure, your contrast, your make little color adjustments if you need to, but I don't really think there's a whole lot that, you don't have to be a Photoshop expert anymore. Right, and, the, and, and using filters and whatnot, you, you, again, that, that doesn't create a timeless look. It's more of a gimmick. It can be. I it's... think there are people who do a beautiful job. I, don't, I certainly don't want to criticize that. Just for us, we, we weren't good at that. We just slapped it on there at 100%, and we never got that <laughs> gift. So we just, just shy away from it. If, we think it's, if we're going to do it poorly, we just try to shy away from it. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about the value of social media. Um, in a marketing plan for any type of business and, and, and clearly we've seen the success of Facebook mm -hmm. and tagging people from a wedding uh, to extend kind of a referral network. How, how important are things like Instagram and Twitter um, to the wedding photographer nowadays? Yeah, I think they're becoming, I mean, it's such an interesting landscape because it's changing every day right now. It's really um, volatile. So we have close to 40,000 followers on Facebook. And we worked really, really hard to build that up over time. And then Facebook just like flipped a switch and was like, just kidding. <laughs> so that's awesome. Um, now it reaches like 200 people or what have you, um, unless we want to pay to promote it. And so um, I think that it's important that you continue to stay relevant and you kind of continue to stay where people are. So we're sort of shifting over more to Instagram now. But we also know that Instagram is owned by Facebook. So we're not putting all our eggs in that basket either. Um, but I think for us, um, we get a lot of success of, oh gosh, I saw that my friend was tagged in a photo you took. I'm friends with them. I came over to the blog. I checked out the site. Then I went and checked out some of, of the personal posts that you guys have. I checked out your about video. I checked out the Justin and Mary section. Holy map, you know, I love you guys. I'm so connected to you guys. That path is really great for us. Um, but again, we don't want somebody who's just like, found you online. A photographer is a photographer is a photographer. You'll do. And so for us, Instagram, social media, Facebook become much more of, hey, you've booked us now or you're a bridesmaid and you're probably going to book us in the near future, we'd love for you to follow us on Instagram so that you see our dog, so that you see our date nights, so that you see the uh, photos of my grandparents' weddings that I post. So that you're getting invested in who we are in particular because it reinforces that I had to have these guys in particular with me. Because here's the thing that I really want to drive home. Our dog and the way that we go on date nights and my grandparents' photos, that's all well and good. But the real reason those matter is because of the way that we see love because of each other and because of how our grandparents loved and the family that we're building. That's how I'm going to see love in other people, too. And I see love not in this big, grand, epic um, Hollywood movie thing. I see it in, um, you know, when I was at WPPI, I was sick the night before I went up. And so Justin put a washcloth on my forehead and he stayed up every 10 minutes to flip it. And I see love in those little things. And when I see him in us, I'll see him in you, too. Okay. Well, I can't. There's, there's nothing. I mean, I'm looking at the most beautiful wedding photo in the world, and then you say that, and all I guess it's the perfect time to let you know that we have a free downloadable guide that that Justin and Mary contributed to. Uh, if you're trying to grow your business now, nah, I feel stupid now talking about business stuff. No. Uh, if you're looking to grow your wedding photography business, Photo Shelter has published a guide that you can get at photoshelter.com/resources. Okay, enough of that promotion. <laughs> Um, uh, another practical question, when you shoot a wedding and you hand those images over to the bride and groom, how are you doing the delivery? Is it all, uh, all, all digital and do you allow them to post it kind of free for all on social media? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, we do deliver uh, digitally. We use pass as our delivery method. Um, what's great about that is it, it enables us to be able to get the images to them very quickly without having to wait for you know, burning discs or shipping things. Yep. Um, but it also gives us stability and backup and a little bit of consistency there. So they, they get those images and I, I can trust that they're going to be, you know, available to the couple for 10 years. Um, that being said, we do actually put a lot of trust in our couples. Um, we're not the kind of people that slap watermarks all over everything and, you know, send out cease and desist every five minutes. Um, it's more important for us that they love their images and that they are able to use their images in a way that serves them really well. Yeah. So for us, um, you know, we do um, we do sell the images. So for us, it's it's not necessarily included right away, um, but 
as soon as if they per, if they decide they're going to purchase those digital images, um, we want them to be able to use them as as much as they possibly can. Yeah, and then um, just to kind of like keep that sort of love going of you know this is what we stand for, this is how we serve. Um, at the wedding day, we actually do something kind of cool, which is we are pulling some images anyway for a little slideshow at the reception, and we found a portable Canon printer. We're actually Nikon, but that's the one thing, Canon, that we buy. Um, and so we bring this Canon printer with us, and we can actually print out an E by 10 on the spot. And so we print it out. We put it in a restoration hardware silver frame, and we give, them to, give it to them at the end of the night. And so now it's we shoot for the silver frame for the next 60 years, and oh, yeah, here's the frame too. Um, and so we do that at the wedding, and then um, two weeks later when we deliver the gallery, <clears throat> because we're going to hit a button that says publish, when the um, online gallery is ready, about two days before we ship them a bottle of champagne through wine.com and we can track it. And when we get the it's arrived notice, we can hit publish on the website and it says, here's a bottle of champagne, go check out your photos, cheers for the next 60 years. So that's kind of fun. Okay, 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 okay. You guys are making me cry over here. Um, <laughs> it's okay. But, <laughs> but it, you know what it sounds like to me also, I mean, and again, I mean, I hate to keep going back to this very pragmatic, practical thing. You guys have written a playbook, hmm. operationalized the way that you want to conduct your business. Yeah. So you know the wine order goes out. You know we have the silver frame. You know we have the, the printer. And you know that this is all a part of how you guys photograph weddings and how you want the customer to perceive the value that they're getting. Yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I, the advice that you're giving, like it's so important to have um, – professionalism, consistency, replicability of all of this stuff. It sounds like you've really thought about this stuff. Oh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> we've we've said some time. Yeah. Um, no. mean, one of the, I would say one of the good things about working as a husband and wife team is that we're together like 23 and a half hours out of the day. <laughs> so when it comes to um, you know, communicating about you know, how we're, how we're going to organize our business and how we're gonna, what types of things we're going to do for our clients, that's all that gets talked about. Now, the downside to that is that at dinner, it's like, so what's new, honey? It's like, yeah. <laughs> absolutely nothing. We know everything that's going on with each other. That's right. But that's a whole other uh, discussion. Um, yeah. I, I will say that, you know, what we've done is we've probably, we've taken a, a look at what's worked for us, and we've elaborated on it, and we've, we're have we very good at taking a look at what doesn't work, which happens a lot, yeah. and saying, you know, how can we change it to be better, or how can we just eliminate that? Yeah. And so all of these things that you're hearing about, you know, the the gifts that we give our clients in the meetings to the the silver frame at the end of the night like these are things that have evolved over the last seven or eight years so it's not something that we just like came up with one day and said oh my god we're gonna start doing this to everybody um, and I think that's that's been hel helpful at least for a younger photographer who's just starting out to not get too overwhelmed because it doesn't have to all it doesn't all have to happen at the same time right. um, but just to think about you know Mary talks about our why and why we do things and, and allow that to kind of be the compass for, you know, what types of gifts, what types of experiences um, you want to give your couples. Yeah. Give us the, the Reader's Digest definition of brand personality and how our listeners should think about brand personality. Well, I think um, if I had to kind of write a definition for it, it would be brand personality is how you want your customers to feel about themselves in virtue of being one of your customers. So that's probably worth repeating. Brand personality is how you want your customers to feel about themselves in virtue of being one of your customers. Perfect example, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC, right? So Mac has been incredible at creating this brand power, this brand personality, where it doesn't just say, I have this awesome logo, I have this awesome commercial, I have this awesome theme song, I have all these kind of um, surface things. Apple actually makes you feel something about who you are as an artist, a creative, cutting edge, the people who change the world are the ones who actually do, the round peg and the square hole. And hey, if you're one of those people, you probably use our products. And hey, if you're using one of our products, you're probably one of those people, right? And so you become part of this culture just from the fact that you all kind of, this community, um, as our friend Caitlin would say, um, that you are all part of this group who probably love and believe the same things. That kind of goes back to your passion will make people pay more. Um, right? We pay way too much probably for Apple laptops. Let's be honest. Um, you could get something that kind of has the same function that's your laptop, your laptop, you'll do a lot cheaper at Best Buy. But we pay for that and we care about that because we're passionate about what they stand for and we feel like we probably stand for those things too if we're one of their customers. Okay. So what's the, what's the, 
what's the Justin and Mary brand personality in yeah. a sentence or two? In a sentence or two, to be a Justin and Mary bride, if you have us as your photographers, you are probably classic, iconic, Jackie Kennedy and Grace Kelly rolled into one, and you probably have this epic love story that up until now the rest of the world saw as ordinary. Um, but the, we don't see ordinary. We believe there are no ordinary moments, and so that's the kind of stories we tell. Okay, and let's talk about how to translate that during the sales process. Yeah. Selling. Oh, that's our yeah. least favorite part. It's everybody's least favorite part, right? The selling. Um, the, the making money is good, but the selling is hard. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, up until now, the whole experience that this couple has been having with us is two-dimensional online. And so now we want to try to make sure that as soon as they walk through the door, they're having the three-dimensional world of Justin and Mary. And so on our new website, we actually have this section called the world of Justin and Mary. That's where it comes from, is we want people walking through the threshold of our door and immediately immersed in us. And so um, we do that by thinking about all five senses. That is not our um, idea. That's actually from the book Love Marks, The Future Beyond Brands. The author Kevin Roberts um, was the former CEO of Saatchi and Saatchi, and he talks about how there's a difference between brands, or what he calls blands, and love mark companies. He says um, brands are two-dimensional, they're your logo, your colors, they're flat, they're boring, they're on a page, whereas a love mark jumps off the page and gives you a great big bear hug, and it does it through all five senses. So how the room smells when they walk in, how it's lit, how it's decorated, what food we serve them, the texture of the materials in that box that I was talking about earlier we give them, um, taste the food we serve them. What did I miss? Touch, taste. All of them. We hit all of them. Um, and so they're coming into this whole experience. And we liken it a lot to going to the spa to get a massage. right? If you just went to the spa to get a massage and it was in a fluorescent hospital room, it was cold with no extras, you probably wouldn't pay $150 for that. Right. So, yeah. Um, I'll let you tell you. Yeah. Actually, what you're seeing here on the slide, this is some of our old packaging um, with our old branding. But um, you get, kind of get a feel for the types of materials that we're using, the, the richness of the boxes, the textures on the ribbons, you know, just everything that we can do to make it both a visually appealing uh, experience, but also like a tactile and um, all the other senses. I don't know the, the descriptive words for them, but just ocular. I don't yeah, know. No, just to, to give you that, that richness to it, where it's not just about, you know, the images that we're providing you, it's about the, the way that we're going to take care of you and the way that we're going to uh, serve you as your, you know, both as a couple together and then also as a client. Yeah. And so as soon as they walk through that door, we have what we call um, the two-minute drill. And so the two-minute drill is that we refuse to kind of talk about business or photography or even their wedding for the first two minutes because we want to be different. And everything that we do with our branding, with our packaging, with the gifts we give them, with the surprises at the wedding, the surprises after, we're trying to be um, what Seth Godin calls Purple Cow, um, which is a great book. If you haven't read it, anybody out there, write it down. It's a really easy one-day read, and it essentially says, um, in a world where you're driving down the road and you see 10,000 brown cows, or you're a photographer, you're a photographer, you'll do, you stop paying attention, and you definitely stop talking about it. Um, but in a world where you're driving along and you see a purple cow after 10,000 brown ones, you pull off the road and you take a picture, you put it on Instagram, and you tell your friends about it. And so we, in every way, want to be the unexpected. If a wedding photography meeting is supposed to take place in a coffee shop and you launch right into showing pictures, we always want to do the opposite of that. So in our home, in a really nice, rich, luxe experience with the food and the senses. And hey, let's talk about Will Ferrell movies and um, The Office and the sunset on the drive-in and um, the latest Mockingjay Hunger Games movie, whatever it is. <laughs> whatever we can connect with people. We meet in our home so I can say, hey, can I serve you this wine? We actually got it when we were out in Napa. Oh, you like Napa? Let me tell you about our trip. And so we're connecting, we're connecting, and ideally two minutes will turn into two hours before we ever really get down to business. And that's that connection part. If we can connect with these people on that point, and that point, and that point, then it starts to feel like who else in the world could capture our day the way that these two could? And yeah. that's where that trust part comes in. We've, we've talked about this uh, a fair bit, but I think it's worth reiterating. How do you turn clients to be ambassadors for you that yeah. continually refer business yeah, I think it's it's the entire experience. So you know we've been talking a lot about uh, the the process leading up to booking and also on the wedding day, but I think it's also there has to be a follow through too. So you have to be able to at the very end of the day, you know, deliver what what's expected and then ab above and beyond, and then also mm -hmm. to be able to follow up with the album, give them a beautiful album that they'll be able to treasure for their you know their kids and grandkids. Yeah. Um, 
just give them that experience from day one all the way through until the end. And I think by the end, they should be ambassadors for you. I don't think yeah. if you give them that great experience, there shouldn't be any reason why they're not talking about you. And then building off of that, <clears throat> we don't want them just talking, right? Because it's not just that they're talking, it's what they're saying. And so we really pull that purple cow mentality through even what we're kind of curating in our couples and our clients to go out and say about us. Um, and it can be cultivated is the good news. So um, for example, if I said, oh gosh, Alan, you should really check out our wedding photographer. She was so great. You're going to go, okay, awesome. Like what couple doesn't say at least that? Hopefully they either say they were terrible or they were great. <clears throat> what if I say to you instead, oh my gosh, this couple, I mean, our wedding photographers were amazing. Um, they gave us <clears throat> this um, frame at the wedding. They printed it off on site. They sent a champagne when our gallery arrived. They gave us this box, this awesome gift just for meeting with them. Um, they took us out to dinner after the engagement shoot and we ended up playing Mario Kart Wii back at their house afterwards. Right? If we give them these in, like specific stories that they can tell people, they're not only going to be remarkable and stand out in people's minds, but they're very specifically curated so that the stories that they tell stand out in the minds of the right people that we want to attract. Right. So there's going to be a client who's going to hate, who's going to absolutely hate the silver frame. They're going to think that's stuffy. But our couple, this classic iconic bride, is going to love that. Let me ask you a question, guys. <laughs> How often do you raise your prices? Oh, oh that, that's a really good question, actually. Every time um, we launch a new website. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what you're describing sounds like there, there, there are expenses to oh, promote absolutely. the business the way that you want to promote it. Heck yeah. Yeah, no, there's definitely expenses. And I would say that we probably have shied more on the cautious side of things mm -hmm. uh, in raising our prices only because we raised them pretty rapidly when we first got started. Um, we were, you know, approximately $2,000, you know, when we first started and then pretty quickly that jumped up to 6000 and at mm -hmm. one point we had packages that were, don't get me wrong, like don't take this the wrong way, but they were 6000 8000 10000 20000 and yeah. not that we ever booked a $20,000 package at that time, um, but we, we were very very um, aggressive in, in how we raised them. Yeah. And it worked, but it was also at a time when you know the, the economy and the climate was a lot, mm -hmm. uh, lot less cautious. And so people were spending money without thinking about it. Now I think uh, clients are much smarter, much more educated. They know what they should be spending approximately. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to make snap decisions most of the time. Most of the time they're going to be thinking about it. They're going to be talking it over with their husband, their sorry, their fiance, um, possibly their parents, yeah. and so um, we've been a little bit more cautious. We have raised our prices um, every year. We've raised our prices the last three years, yeah. um, and the largest jump we've made is when we actually launched the new site this year. Yeah. So, um, but I think uh, a couple of things. One is um, just getting to the costs of this whole experience that we put on. We budget for every single couple that is going to be about six hundred dollars. Um, that we're pouring back into them right off the top of their package. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like a lot of money, and it's certainly not what we were spending in the very beginning. It was $25 on a box that we spray painted in our driveway, right? You figure it out. Which I don't recommend. Which we don't recommend. Uh, they stick together. It's not good. Um, but $600 right off the top, if you think about it, we were spending $10,000 in print ads when we were first getting started, which brought us exactly $0 in return to be yeah. spent. So we just divide that among, you know, 20 couples, 25 couples, and now it's kind of the same budget, a little bit more, but... A, I don't know, 4,000% return difference. Like, um, that's the kind of, you know, spend $400 and leave a book at a venue that turns into $40,000 worth of bookings over the course of a few years. That's the kind of investments we want to be making. Not yeah, and highly ad. targeted marketing, right? It's not, it's not a brochure yeah. that gets handed out a thousand times. It's this box contains stuff for you. Right. Yes. That's right. Yes. Um, so people love it, and um, we also choose gifts, like for example, at the holidays we'll do a um, Crate and Barrel Christmas frame, holiday frame ornament with one of their photos in it, and it has the year on it and a silver tag. And everybody forgets to get their My First Mary, you know, holiday ornament, but we're kind of taking care of that for them. And now they hang it on the year, on the tree year after year, and we get emails from clients it's five, six years back, look what I'm hanging, and it just reminds them of us um, <clears throat> over the long haul. And it also reminds them of us at a time when a lot of their friends are getting engaged, which is pretty fun. You just have to make sure you put a hashtag on the ornaments. No. Yes. All yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I won't even charge you for that advice. Yeah. No. <laughs> Alan, we'll send you a commission on that one. Yeah. That's <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah, we do. That's awesome. So we are at the end, which means it's time to give away a, a 24 to 70 Ooh. Tamron 2.8 lens, beautiful lens, 
that is if Sarah wants to tell me who won the lens. Hey, Sarah, you there? We'll see. If, if, if we don't get her uh, right away, we'll make sure to notify you. Oh, Sarah is here. She's texting me. Here comes the winner. Uh, for, all, for those of you who joined us maybe a little bit late or had some audio trouble, we are recording this entire thing. It's, there's just so much information. There's a lot of um, different books and brands and things that Justin and Mary uh, have mentioned. But here's the, big, here's the big clincher right here. The winner of the Tamron 24-70 f2.8 lens, and we'll be emailing you, is Ed Connolly. Congratulate, congratulations, Ed Connolly. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Uh, we talked about the, the, the Justin and Mary Weddings.com uh, website, the blog. One of them is Justin and Mary Blog.com, mm -hmm. Facebook.com slash Justin and Mary. Uh, and, and the two other uh, blogs that you guys produce, will you remind us again? Sure. It's uh, The Black Tie Bride, which is uh, TheBlackTieBride.com, and also The Well Groomed Groom, which is WellGroomedGroom.com. Yeah. No the on the second one. Well, you can put that. I have both of them. Oh, good job. Oh, he's got both. Oh well. <laughs> I was um, before we started the the webinar. I was uh, telling Justin and Mary that I had actually met them many many years ago at WPBI, and I interviewed them for, I think we did some sort of blog post somewhere, uh, and I was impressed back then as I am now. I mean the the, the information and the thoughtfulness and what you guys are saying. So mm -hmm. appreciate your time, guys. Really, oh, really. Oh no problem. Thank them. you so much for having us. We have uh, another webinar coming up next week. If you're around and you want to know about copyright, the lawyer Ed Greenberg, who is a copyright litigator, and the photographer instructor Jack Resnicki have a new book coming out called The Copyright Zone. So this is the copyrights and your rights, the facts and fictions with the copyright guys. On March 25th at 4 p.m., look out for the announcement on blog.photoshelter.com. Once again, Justin and Mary, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for spending the hour with us. It was fantastic. No problem. And thanks to all of you guys at home who are watching. So for uh, Photo Shelter, this is Alan Robayashi. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.